Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the conference on fisheries and aquaculture, showcasing India as a hub for aquaculture and fisheries investment. This session focuses on advances in post harvest infrastructure and processing. With the focus on boosting the fish production and productivity, the greatest need is for an effective and economically viable supply chain, which connects the production centers to the consumption centers, thereby reducing physical waste and the loss of this highly perishable commodity. As the trend is moving towards increased focus on quality, safety, price and health, investment in appropriate infrastructure and post harvest handling of marine and inland fisheries becomes critical to ensure minimum wastage. This session will deliberate on key interventions needed to strengthen the handling of fish at catching, handling infrastructure at ports, fish landing centers, different modes of long distance transport, development of modern fish markets, cold chain support at fish processing units and other supply chain areas. To moderate this session, we have with us Mr. Pankaj Mehta, co-chairman CII Task Force on Post Harvest and Logistics and Managing Director Carrier Transit Coal, India and South Asia. We also have a very eminent lineup of speakers with us for this session. We are very pleased to have with us Dr. J. Balaji, Joint Secretary, Marine Fisheries, Department of Fisheries, Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairy. Dr. Balaji's leadership has been instrumental towards our initiatives to enable ease of doing business and unlocking enablers for exports towards realizing the sector's potential. We also have with us Mr. Satyam S. Sundaram, Partner and Government Transaction Advisory Services, EY. Mr. Christian Carter, Commercial Counselor, Royal Norwegian Embassy. Mr. Alex Ninan, Managing Director, Baby Marine International. Mr. Arjun Gadre, Managing Director, Gadre Marine Export. Mr. Matthew Joseph, Co-Founder, Fresh to Home. Dr. Shine Kumar, CS, Director, National Institute for Fisheries Post Harvest Technology and Training. With this, I now hand over the session to Mr. Mehta, please. Uh, thank you, Rituja, and good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I, I am uh, so privileged to be uh, moderating a session with such eminent speakers. Uh, you know, we have Dr. Balaji. Thank you, sir, for joining the session. And, uh, you know, uh, I will really look forward to hearing your views. See, uh, the opportunity in fishery aquaculture doesn't need to be, uh, you know, emphasized more. We are so blessed with such a vast coastline and the, the opportunity of creating this as a very focused industry gives so many opportunities for the youth of the country. We are in the midst of a startup culture. There are startup companies and we, we again are, you know, uh, happy to have one startup with us, we would uh, really like to hear views from him. We see a very clear focus uh, from the government. Uh, we heard the minister himself, uh, Sri Rupalaji, you know, emphasizing on the need to grow the sector, on the need for cold chain, other infrastructure uh, opportunities. We heard uh, Mr. Swain, uh, secretary uh, from the Department of Fisheries, again, uh, Echoing the same need for, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure and support. So this session is on advances of post harvest uh, infrastructure and processing. There are gaps. There is no denying that there are gaps both at the point of harvest at uh, processing post harvest. So infrastructure has to be built, but we must also be very cautious that it has to be responsible growth. We need infrastructure which is economical and efficient, but we need to balance it with sustainability. We need to make sure that the infrastructure we create today doesn't create problems for tomorrow. So without uh, you know, further ado, I would straight away uh, jump into the session. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Satyam Sundaram, uh, partner EY, who would uh, you know, be Doing some context setting, uh, Mr. Sundaram has uh, over 15 years experience uh, leading various strategy projects, uh, benchmarking studies, market analysis in India and overseas. So with that, I would like to hand over to Satyam. Satyam, all yours. Thank you, Mr. Pankaj Mehta. It's indeed a pleasure to be here. Uh, good morning to all the delegates and uh, good morning to all the participants here. Sure. 
I'll just try and uh, get the presentation up. So as Mr. Pankaj alluded in his opening remarks that, you know, post harvest infrastructure is one of the key important areas to look at so far as fisheries is concerned. And we have been fortunate to have a sector wherein we had the leadership of the joint secretaries that we have here, as well as the secretaries and the ministers who have led this over the years. And there has been a systematic progress that we have seen. And therefore, today, uh, this session, our panelists would largely be also discussing upon uh, you know, what we have already achieved and where, uh, what is it that based on this base, we could move forward. So in this context, I will uh, you know, just share a few statistics, which probably during the day may get repeated again by uh, many of us uh, as the uh, you know, details related to the fishery sector and also pose a few, uh, uh, you know, uh, queries or questions which probably could be deliberated further in terms of our own advances that what we do you probably need to look at in the uh, post harvest sector. So, next slide, please. Next, please. So, let me quickly talk about, uh, you know, fisheries as a sector when we look at in India. It's second so far as the aquaculture production is concerned. And the total contribution that we see in the gross value addition at the national level is 1.24% to the GDP so far as this sector is concerned. And it's growing at a rate of around 10.88-11% or so with a production growth of uh, around 8%. And therefore, there is a bit of service sector growth which is happening more than the production itself, uh, which is evident from here. That further probably needs to increase. Over and above that, there's also export, uh, which we can see around 10% increase. And this 10% to be put in a context would be $6.7 billion of export is what India has been able to do in the marine fisheries itself in 19 and 20. However, as we talked about why post-harvest becomes important is that as per certain estimates, the post-harvest loss is in the range of 20 to 25% uh, you know, that, that leave or take, give or take a few percentage this way or that way. So with that kind of a loss that we see, and this is not something specific to fisheries uh, itself, it's around the uh, agriculture and uh, allied sector that we see uh, this kind of a loss that we have. In fact, being, being a perishable thing, uh, it's probably uh, something that we'll have to work further on the infrastructure side, particularly the post-harvest infrastructure as we are looking at. Uh, as we see, this sector has been uh, recognized as a sunrise sector in India, and it employs more than 14.5 uh, million people uh, as per the Committee of Doubling Farmers Income Group, uh, which was set up in 2018. If you look at the kind of government interventions that we see at the bottom in 15, 16 to 1920 as a part of the revolution, an investment of around 3,000 crores or the funding of around 3,000 crores in various forms was available, which increased and the next two are overlapping and so therefore uh, may not be exactly uh, the multiplier that we should be looking at because 18 to 19 to 2023 uh, as a part of FIDF, around 7,500 crores is what has been considered in that fund and then 20,000 crores is what we are looking at in PMMSY. Of course, there is an overlap between the two, as I said. So there is a multiple fold increase in terms of the investment commitment, in terms of the uh, infrastructure, in terms of the investment that is happening both from the government side and therefore what is expected also from the private sector side as we move in this sector. Next, please. So in terms of what is it that we look, uh, we need to do given that kind of investment commitment that we have. Number one, as we saw in the last slide, the waste is being around 20 to 25%. That's something that we, uh, there has to be some work done in terms of the current waste is, uh, 
uh, what are those post harvest infrastructure that we need to create, which can help us reduce the wastage. Not only reduce the wastage, we will also show you later in terms of even the damages that happened in the process of, uh, you know, fish production and they're after reaching to the market and those damages also lead to lesser realized value. So how should we reduce those damages to the fishes so that the, uh, you know, realized value is enhanced uh, apart from uh, they not being counted in terms of the wastage. The second, of course, is in terms of the quality and the fitness of the product as I talked about. The third would be to ensure that we maintain the basic hygiene, particularly as we are talking about uh, both the export and domestic market moving forward. What are those activities that we need to do in terms of testing, in terms of various processes, in terms of various infrastructure that we need to provide? And they may not be very big automated infrastructures that we are talking about. These could be smaller interventions as well. What is it that we need to do in terms of increasing the accessibility to the market? What is it that we need to do in terms of value realization to the farmers? Because what is the end game that we are looking at from the government side is in terms of how is it that we are going to increase the uh, value uh, to the ultimate, uh, you know, owners of the whole value chain, the fish farmers, the fish or fox that we are talking about. How is it that they will get the maximum value out of it? And last but not, not the least, as a part of this, then we should be able to increase the income, double the income of all the fisher fox, fisher farmers who are involved and therefore, uh, you know, contribute towards the poverty elevation process that we are looking at. Next, please. This is what I was talking about in terms of numbers, if we look at, and these are some statistics, uh, one could debate a few, uh, as I said, give or take a dollar this way or that way. The idea here is that probably in the same, uh, you know, culture, as we can see, the fresh or the chilled fish, uh, you know, in from India gets around $2.12, whereas from Sri Lanka probably gets around 10 to 11. It is not to say that the difference is only based on the post-harvest infrastructure, but probably that plays one of the key roles. Probably that's something that our imminent group here could, uh, you know, point out further in terms of the kind of interventions that we need to do in order to ensure that our products also get the kind of, uh, you know, uh, prices that they are getting. It could also be in terms of with how deep are we able to get, get into the ocean, what kind of quality of product are we harvesting, what size are we harvesting. So all those aspects are important and they all would contribute to this, but to the extent that the interventions on the post-harvest side will be able to help us in terms of uh, increasing the value realization for fish farmers would be very critical and would be something that we would look forward to hearing from our, our all our esteemed guests who are here today and the panelists here. Next. Uh, we will just try and show you a couple of videos uh, uh, that we have based on our site visits that we uh, our team had done sometime earlier, uh, uh, you know, in terms of what we are seeing in India and what we see in some of the other markets. Please go ahead. And in no context, it is to uh, talk about a particular, uh, uh, you know, can we show first the Indian video, please? It's just an illustrative example. Uh, this uh, probably is a similar case that we will see across various markets, various uh, fish markets uh, that we visit. So the example taken here is just an illustration and not to suggest uh, anything specific about any particular market that we are looking at. So this is how in India, uh, I, you know, some of the markets that we are seeing, uh, medium to uh, smaller markets that we have. Uh, how they operate and how they work and in fact in collective language we also talk about uh, you know don't make it a fish market so you know how do we move away from don't make it fi a fish market to what we will see in the next video that yes we must behave like a fish market so that's the transformation that we need to get into don't be a fish market to become a fish market and that mindset change and that kind of collectible, uh, you know, discussions would only come from once we create the kind of infrastructure that you would see in the next two videos that uh, we are going to share. One is from uh, this Dubai market. Uh, if you look at the kind of difference uh, uh, when we were comparing.
so this is one of the uh, harbor uh, uh, you know movements where uh, you know planes are being used to lift and then the sorting process uh, which is being used in terms of the conveyor belt uh, for the whole sorting purposes and movement Pilot jets being used for moving good. Yeah. So in terms of, you know, post harvest, we did show you some of the uh, examples of uh, what is happening in India vis-a-vis -vis, uh, some of the other countries. What we probably, uh, you know, as a team, as a group here, would also be uh, cognizant as probably not all those infrastructure is something that we may be interested in or at least a part of it or maybe all of them. So, you know, a, a, a glimpse of that, a thought around what you think in terms of the post harvest, whether it's a fish landing center, whether it's the cold storage, uh, you know, places or any of the other value chain that we are looking at, uh, you know, where is it that we need to invest? Where is it that we have a gap uh, which is far more, uh, uh, you know, uh, intriguing and will add immediate value. The value for money is maximum. And therefore, that's the kind of investment that we need to make. We would be looking forward to hearing from the uh, members here. Next, please. Next, please. Uh, we would also, uh, le before I get to my last slide, uh, let me also just quickly point out the targets which have been set in the uh, Prime Minister's, uh, 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 you know, Prime Minister Matsya Sampada Yojana, uh, wherein we look at uh, fishing harbors, we are looking at 12 of them, as you saw some of the automation processes. So it's not that that has not been thought through. There has been certain thinking which has gone. Uh, now, the question one could ask is whether these 12 are sufficient. Or considering our coastline of 7,000 plus kilometers, are we looking at more of it? Are these 275 markets sufficient or are we looking at more uh, support from the government side? Or do we think that with these demonstration projects, we will be able to attract private sector? Or what is it that the private sector would need to further multiply, create a multiplier effect to these infrastructure that we are talking about? So those are the probably intriguing questions. Those are the uh, probably uh, areas uh, where some more interventions would help us in terms of understanding and in terms of appreciating and putting these numbers that we see uh, in terms of, uh, you know, fishing harbors, retail market, fish landing centers, wholesale markets, cold storage or fish kiosks. These con numbers could then be put into the context in the uh, 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 whole uh, numbers that we are talking about in the Indian context where we have a decent uh, size of, uh, you know, as we said, coastline as well as brackish and uh, fresh water area in terms of square kilometers, if we look at roughly 1400,000 to uh, 16,000 uh, square kilometers of area in each of, of these brackets to fresh water that we are looking at. Next, please. So, therefore, uh, you know, in terms of what we, uh, as I was talking about that the fish market syndrome that we have needs to change and we must say, uh, we must think that come 2030, 2035, we will say, let's behave like a fish market rather than otherwise while I'm repeating myself, but that, that should be the motto that we should be looking at. In order to do that, we need to look at from the, uh, you know, market till the back end, uh, till the production starting point, where is it that the infrastructure gap is maximum to best of my understanding in India, we don't have a, a detailed understanding and a gap of uh, infrastructure across this value chain, which has been estimated and created. So probably one should look at uh, that study being done and quantifying each one of those gaps and therefore looking at as to how and de developing a strategy around each one of them. The second would be uh, in terms of, uh, you know, as we said, a lot of fish is sold raw in our case. There's lesser of value addition. Now, how is it that we could look at more and more value additions, which is what will get us more value for the fish farmers, fish folks that we are looking at. Processing largely in India is limited to shrimps. How do we move forward and create processing for other uh, varieties as well? Similarly, in terms of 
cold storage capacity, uh, which in this case would be very critical to us, is currently around 1%. How could we look at extending that or is that sufficient in terms of the larger context and in terms of the way the whole industry is moving is something we need to debate. And the last one, uh, as I said, globally, uh, the fish is being consumed mainly in the processed format form, whereas in India, it has been sold and uh, consumed more in terms of the uh, raw fish consumption. So both from Indian context as to how do we see this consumption pattern moving in the next five years, as well as from the uh, you know uh, export context, how do we see the infrastructure requirement in terms of processing is something and therefore those numbers that I talked about in the previous slide may need to be further put into the context. With that, uh, I will hand it over back to uh, Mr. Mehta, Mr. Pankaj. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sundaram. Uh, I'm sure the videos that you showed were desired to create a shock effect. Uh, which I'm sure they did. I mean, comparing probably one of the worst wet markets in India to one of the, you know, more advanced uh, processing centers is actually not a fair comparison because we have many good, uh, you know, markets in India too. And on this panel where we have, uh, you know, eminent uh, fish experts like uh, uh, Mr. Gadre and uh, Baby Marine and Gadre Marine and Fresh to Home, uh, which is endeavoring to you know, change this outlook, but uh, I'm I'm thankful for uh, you know uh, seeing reality as it is in many parts of the country. But uh, there are also uh, these are not fair uh, you know comparisons. I would say so. With that, uh, I would now uh, you know request uh, Dr. J Balaji to kindly give us his keynote address. Uh, Dr. Balaji, as you know, uh, is Joint Secretary. Uh, Marine Fisheries Department of Fisheries Ministry of uh, Fisheries and Husbandry and Dairy. So, uh, with that, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Balaji, and we keenly await uh, your words. Thank you, and uh, good morning to all of you, Mr. Pankaj Mehta Ji, Managing Director, Kiri Trans Coal in India and South Asia, Mr. Satyam S. Sundaram, Partner. Government and Transaction Advisory Service, Ernst Neng. Mr. Christian Rodriguez Wilders Carter, apologies if the name I didn't spell properly. Commercial Counselor, Royal Norwegian Embassy. Mr. Alec Nainan, Managing Director, Baby Marine, International. Mr. Arun Gadre, Managing Director, Gadre Marine Export. Mr. Matthew Joseph, Co-Founder Fresh to Home. Mr. Dr. Shiny Kumar, Director, National Institute of Fisheries Post Harvest Technology and Training, and all the distinguished um, participants in this on this call, invitees. Thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak. Already, our colleague Mr. Satyam has very well set the context for today's uh, uh, session. I'd just like to highlight some of the points which I felt. I had a long presentation, but I thought uh, given the time constraints, it will be better we discuss right and come to the issues. So coming to that, to the key issues, you might have seen that government of India is focused for infrastructure development. As far as this sector is concerned, historically, when I, I have joined this sector in around three years ago, we found that this sector has grown on its own. The total governmental support still for 2014 defined. I look at around for the harbors itself was around 17, 700 crores, and plus another 700 crore for the infrastructure. If you look at since independence, I'm saying 1500 crores. Again, still 2021, it is around another 1500 crores. So roughly the total governmental support, we can't, there's a lot of issue. We cannot compare the value of 50s with the value of 90s or 2000s. But definitely what I want to say is that the support from the government was suboptimal as far as the infrastructure uh, development in this country is concerned, the fishery sector. But after 2000, there has been a huge change in the approach. When the sector, shifted from marine to inland, 
the production levels have gone up. One third is marine today, and two thirds come from inland fisheries, the fish production in this country. At the same time, governments felt that the sector has been growing, as Mr. Satyam has said, it has grown at 10 percent plus for several years. At the same time, the exports grew even at 20 percent at certain points of time, but for COVID. So we have seen that there is a huge opportunity. Honorable Prime Minister has recognized this and has the government has felt that there is a need for supporting this sector sector. And accordingly, last five, six years, more than 30,000 crores investments have been rolled or tied up. Another 10 to 15,000 crore investment we are working with the World, the World Bank project. That is also mostly not on the production side. That will be more on value chain, marketing, infrastructure, especially to support the small farmers at the same time, also aggregation. We are also looking at a process almost where the blueprints are ready. Maybe we look at around an investments of maybe by 24, 25, 26, three, four years down the line, 50,000 crores. If you are looking at these investments, our internal understanding is these investments again will generate the required ecosystem around the fulcrum of which the private sector will develop and also will contribute. Around my understanding, rather, or rather from various reports, is that we can generate almost one is to three. If one rupee government spends, the private sector will bring in three rupees. So from that perspective, we see that the possibility of around one and a half lakh crore investments to flow in this sector over five years. That is the idea. On these, with this background, we started off. We never anticipated COVID. Yes, COVID is a setback, a temporary setback, no doubt at all. But as far as that is more, mostly on the export side. But COVID has been a blessing to us in certain aspects, especially if you look at fresh to home or if you look at leashes, we look at the new normals of eating fish. Definitely the required nudge has happened through COVID. These, are, these companies are really doing well and I see a great potential in next four to five years. Maybe we migrate more off to the e-commerce e platforms, which will do the, the marketing of fish and quality and many things will be automatically taken care of. But at the same time, we have to understand that huge quantity of fish production without a commensurate market will also have its own challenges. We have seen this and are seeing this as far as the shrimp sector. Shrimp sector, the fisher, the fisher, the aqua farmers are really having concerns. They say that the cost of productions are increasing and the time at the same time, the market what they are getting is very low. And the farm gate price is only not even 10% returns they are saying they're not getting. At the same time, there are challenges of disease, disease management, risk is also there. So if from these perspectives, we have to look at infrastructure when we are saying that infrastructure, marketing and all this. So what I like to say is too much production can lead to glut. There will be requirement of huge processing facility, but India's domestic consumers are not ready for eating processed food. It's a myth if we can say next five, 10 years, we will change. That's it. I, I don't think that will work. I'm sorry, the background, we are getting some sound because of the Republic Day rehearsals going around. The planes are going. So, sorry, eh? apologies. Second. So, we should be ready for this. If you really think that overnight I'll change, will change to a processed food consumption, a frozen food consumption, it will be challenging. Maybe it can be, we can capture the cities. I have done some preliminary analysis. There is an opportunity of 35,000 to 40,000 crore investments which can flow in the cities, in the post harvest and marketing. As far as uh, we look at the top 10 cities of the country, having a, having a customer base of uh, around 10 crores, if you enhance their fish eating meals by a couple of meals more or so, we have done some calculations. 
So there, the companies like Licious, uh, for that matter, Fresh to Home, or any other company can definitely see an opportunity. Another challenge what we have is in this country is we are a carp eating country. Means we do not eat the tilapias or for that matter the fungaceous to the extent what some of the other countries do. But the things are gradually changing. In the North India and Middle India, there is a definitely the fungaceous is taking roots. But still, our culture is you are an Indian major carp country. The whole South Asia is an Indian major carp country which does not have export opportunities. The current type of fish we have. So this is also an area where a post-harvest marketing strategies work. Whether we can market for the domestic consumers, we have a huge base, these particular fish. And that fish, nobody consumes in a processed form, rather than frozen form, rather, sorry to say. Now we have to address this challenge. How do you address this challenge? How do you address a rohu or a katla to be eaten in a frozen form in this deep India? We have to look at that deep in the central India or for that matter, inland areas. Our government focuses is now on inland sector. We see the fish productions can increase in inland sector and we feel that this is a neglected sector. And un unless you cannot even China also if you look at their growth story also looks starts from their domestic markets they have really their domestic markets have really grown in fact one of the reasons why we succeeded is because of huge import requirements from China as far as the the fish the products or, or marine products from globally they have import there while they are the largest importer they are also largest exporter but definitely there is a huge domestic market we have to look at that. We are also looking at the new startup culture has come into this country. You are aware last week we have launched a startup challenge. And this is one area again, we have to really capitalize for this sector. But I was the one who wrote some of the guidelines in fund of funds and all in the startup India program when I was working in another ministry, DPIAT. What I find is most of India startups are IT based startups. This is the one thing which we have to take note of. While IT based startups are encouraged, it is also important in post harvest and marketing. We have to have a non IT based startups in fisheries sector. This is also an important aspect we should also work on. And most challenging is no data available. There is no data as on day. What is the optimal requirement of the infrastructure. If you look at your processing plants, they say that only 60% of their installed capacity is now utilized. So we have capacities. They were saying to us, already if you double the export, the export purpose, because most of the processing persons are designed for export purposes. While my colleague Mr. Satyam has shown a very, you know, uh, anarchic market, I would say it's a world that that's not all. If you look at the coastal India, it is dotted with one of the best infrastructure facilities, processing plants are there, no doubt at all. But they have a huge capacities already created. There's a glut in pro capacities, but no production. There is no production. There is they are not even processing 60% and storing their facilities. Now, challenges in cold storage. Every one of us say we require cold storage. When I talk to a several individual, you know, exporter, they say, I don't put in cold storage and waste my cost because it won't add more than half a dollar or one dollar. It is challenging to put the product in cold storage and store for six months, eight months. So that is no thank you, they say. No, but where the problem is, the cold storage are skewed in their distribution. We have to look at our more deeper into the India where we can put where, where of cold storages or for that matter processing facilities. What we believe is infrastructure will in turn lead to production increase. That is one thought process we do. It will pull the production. The PLI scheme which the government has launched perhaps we are very much eager that the marine sector will take off because it will also pull production. That is the idea. Is, it's, a, it's a good idea. In fact, even in Matcha Sampada Yojana, when you look at the PMMSY, if you real terms, if you look at it, it won't give more than 20 lakh additional fees. We expect that 
the infrastructure where we spend around seven to eight thousand crores we are spending will pull production more areas will come into cultivation as because there is an infrastructure created now one thing i should tell you on the harbors on the harbors we have made an attempt to talk to the states india we have around almost 1500 plus fish landing centers we have developed around 300 of them fish landing centers include fishing harbors also now these fish landing centers definitely their infrastructure has been improved but only governmental intervention support through which we have done because basically they are not a business entities in the sense in the like a shipping hub like a port there is no market there is no transportation there is no landing and there is no exit or imports and all that and export it's only a glorified landing center the harbors where the fish comes and in a hygienic manner they are stored there is a huge in huge requirement of private sector participation however the problem we are facing is all the harbors and landing centers except seven of them are with the state governments the state governments should come forward to say i encourage private sector to develop my harbors as it has been done in case of any other major infrastructure projects but recently mr satyam is aware we had a long meetings with the states no thank you they said our fisherman will not agree to hand over the fishing harbors to any private sector so this is gone for next five years let us be very clear so this is a huge bag so everywhere now government only has to spend now government has a ambitious plans to spend around 9000 crores that is our plan in the harbor side we will spend 3500 crores from matcha sampada yojana 1500 crores we already sent from fidf the 5000 crores is tied up size more money state governments are bringing around 2000 crores or so and sagarmala of the ministry of port shipping and waterways they are also are supporting 50% so we foresee an investment of 8 to 9000 crores in the harbors but the requirement is almost 2 lakh crores if you look at the entire country's harbors if you want to develop your 1500 that's one estimate somebody one okay, one guy wrote to me a letter saying that almost 1 lakh 70 thousand crores is required to develop we didn't do a study this is one study which we'll take up now what is the real cost what is the requirement of developing our harbors all our harbors dubai is a small country we have we have around 8000 square kilometer 8000 kilometers of coast length so we have a huge cost huge requirement so if everything government has to spend then it is a challenge it takes time we have to wait for our turn public funding won't won't come so fast only this is a golden era has started maybe if we can deliver things faster maybe governments will get impressed one new thoughts are coming new ideas are being floated around whether like an annuity model or some other model whether we can develop whether we can do many things these are certain things the industry has to really mobilize the thought process to the state governments you have to work with the state governments also in order to ensure that some of them come forward if, if the successes are shown so like if you look at muttam harbor everyone talks about muttam harbor that is a private harbor that is a personally that is that, 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 that everybody has to go into the reason why that has developed so if you look at that model normally normal scenario how the state governments will come forward that is the industry should push now why industry is not coming forward industry has has to come forward with investments and the returns so i don't think any industry really has done only day before yesterday a one paper landed on my table saying that we are ready to invest in a harbors in the country and we will turn with the many things are presented so this is one gap area which we have to work industry has to work convince the people convince the state government convince the fishermen then regarding the another more key area is again the how do you enhance the value of your marine fish which is being caught today if you say 6.8 billion dollar is your export 4.8 comes from shrimps 2 billion is the one which is coming from marine sector 
marine sector the investment and like a cooperative model or a buyback agreements between the fishermen and the industry has not come forward this is one area which i have been requesting industry every industry says i'll go and do fishing and i'll get my catch that no thank you it won't work nobody will allow no states will bite that bullet with many states nobody will give any industrialist to big, bring a big vessel of 100 meter to india and just start fishing it doesn't happen in my time i don't think it will happen the way i'm just telling you very candid with apologies if anybody has so think within this constraints we have to find solutions the solution is whether the industry can make a group of fishermen fishermen fish the fish industry take the good product whether they can be an industry support the fishermen and a buyback arrangements can be done with a shore based infrastructure plus quality fishing infrastructure it can be boats also it can be many things that is welcome we have we are welcome and states also welcome so this is one more area which we have now what an, another problem is fisherman doesn't have that much resources to buy such a huge vessel because then again when we introduced a 1.5 crores or 1.2 crore scheme everybody are asking for subsidies if really system works without subsidies we have to look at a system how do you work then if we talk to csl to cochin shipyard limited they say they have developed five six prototypes of fishing vessels industry has to accept them talk to the fishermen support partially the fishermen industry has to invest and give to the fishermen and take back the product and have a transparent arrangements done where government should facilitate this is a system which may work as far as the marine side is concerned so these are some of my thoughts and two more areas are there one is the marine cage cultivation in coastal waters many states have then now there the thought process is to encourage cage fishing in the coastal waters i specify it is coastal waters so we have to look at how we really can take this opportunity goa has come forward some andhra is in the advanced stage are coming with their policy blueprint we are also insisting all state to go for mariculture in the coastal area so this is also one area where we require huge infrastructure requirements also would be there so these are some of the issues but historically our governments have been supporting small size projects one of the criticism which i faced because i had the opportunity to write the pmmsy scheme i wrote it i can take it uh, uh, the criticism also that you should you so you didn't concentrate on large in entrepreneurs but the governments can give subsidy to certain extent you can give 2 crore subsidy 3 crore subsidy but when i have to give a 100 in a 100 crore project 30 crore 40 crore subsidy then the processes will be very cumbersome then it will go on a more on a ppp road route but still we wanted to encourage that we have rolled out the entrepreneur models we told the state government we told our nfdb if anybody larger subsidy is bit of a larger we can give but entrepreneur models of 7 crores 8 crores can be rolled out where we give up to 150 lakhs as a subsidy 1.5 crore subsidy we say so these are some of my thought process whether we can integrate the convergence is the one which is missing in the sector the convergence with food processing ministry is very essential convergence with commerce ministry is essential all these players has to come together the industry can make a pivotal role in this they can support us and one last point is the north india is now em gradually emerging as a aquaculture hub gradually we look at around 10000 hectares in next 3 5 years where there will be a marine capture rather sorry aquaculture of the shrimp aquaculture is also coming there one tilapia plan we are also making which is in advanced stage we are in touch with cii has taken lot of pains to develop that we are also looking at an opportunity of tilapia the tilapia problem is simple states should own it is in, it is done in the inland areas aquaculture is an inland subject the government of india will be complementing and uh, you know supplementing the efforts any policy document i i i do it but the states are not owning up it will not work for example i'll tell as a part of ease of doing business decreasing regulatory burden we transferred the power to give telapia permission to state governments not a single state has given in one year 
Not a single permission has been given from Andhra Pradesh also. I'm just sharing you very candidly. So the state has to come on board. Now the challenge for the state government is the big reservoir has to be handed over to a larger in a, in a large size because tilapia the one dollar is should is the is the domestic you know market size that will cost it should do in seventy five rupees. Cost of production I am told is sixty rupees. Is you have to do in seventy rupees you have to do. But while international market states around 1.3 to 1.5 dollar per kilogram or per, 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 per I don't know, I think it is only kilogram. So that they were telling like that. So the cost of production today, 80 to 90 rupees to 120 rupees doesn't work at all. There should be economy, large scale for cultivation would be there. Larger cultivation has to be there. Larger cultivation requires larger you know, contracts, big contracts big lease period where you will really have an associated infrastructure. So, they, but again, there is a huge opportunity for tilapia which, with a good infrastructure back end. I think tilapia can be the next fish like the Vanami stream. With this, I will just uh, thank you very much. These are some of my thoughts. I think we have to work within these constraints. And also branding is the one thing which is made. Brand India is the one thing internationally has to done. done and the industry has to come forward. And if you look at other sectors, I had an opportunity to interact with DPIIT, commerce and all that. Lot of inputs and comes from the industry. But I should tell in this forum that there is a need for more and more interface between the industry and the fisheries department. More and more interface should be there. Direct interface is required, which unfortunately is not there. The, because the limited infra interface is with the commerce ministry, which as a look from an export perspective. But there is a huge domestic market. We haven't seen any IT company or anybody interface, inter, you know, either interface with the governments. So there is a need for more and more interface with the government so that there is a good policy setting. Because we in, in, in government at a senior level, we come and go. We have a limited understanding of the sector. But the continuity of the sector is with you and you know better what exactly is required. With this, thank you very much for speaking. I think I've taken a more time. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, our work, uh, today's meeting will be successful and some good points will emanate. Please give us good ideas. We will be always there to move. Money is not a constraint in government. We have to justify everything. And if you can justify really, money is not a constraint. And we are ready to support the sector. Thank you again for a nice uh, meeting for the CIA and all the today's organizers and the moderator. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Balaji. Really insightful uh, uh, talk from your side. As, as you rightfully said, many challenges, many opportunities, many obstacles. But I'm sure with your guidance and your vision, we will be able to solve some of these. And one very important point uh, which you mentioned was there is need for continuous interaction, continuous dialogue between industry and government, both at the state level, at the center level, to solve these problems. I mean, these problems or opportunities both uh, can be such a big opportunity for the young Indians as a source of livelihood. We've heard about entrepreneurship schemes. We've heard about startup schemes. We also heard, uh, you know, one very important point uh, Balaji, you made was the uh, inadequate usage of cold storage and the need that, you know, storing is not the solution. I totally agree. Now, the thought that it is moving from cold storage to a cold chain where the product needs to reach the market at the earliest in the best quality and not be stored because as again, you mentioned that Indians don't prefer eating frozen products, which have been kept long. So considering that the need is of connectivity, maybe, you know, more reefer trucks, more points of aggregation, as you mentioned, this is a very fragmented production area. We need to aggregate, we need to move it quickly. Uh, again, I would also like to come back to one point that, uh, you know, Mr. Sudarshan made on the losses you know, on 20, 25% losses. I think this is again something, there are two kinds of losses if you ask me. One is the value loss because of deterioration of quality, because of the product uh, spoilage at, in transit. And the second, I think more is the 
opportunity loss the loss because of not able to access markets where you get better value so uh, i think these are very very powerful points we discuss and uh, you know we would like to jump right into our panel uh, we have uh, so much uh, you know knowledge in the panel and as uh, dr balaji said at the end of the discussion we would like to come up with very clear points that we can take back to the government and saying this is what the industry wants from the government and these are the you know areas where we need support so let me start uh, by getting on to my first speaker uh, mr alex ninan he is the managing director baby marine and uh, i i would request him to put across a perspective of the infrastructure required from the point of catch to the reaching the market over to you mr ninan Uh, good afternoon to everyone, uh, respected uh, Joint Secretary Bishwajit, Dr. Palaji, and I also see Dr. Sagar Mehra also uh, in this. Uh, other fellow panelists, delegates uh, in the session, and dear friends. So it gives me a great pleasure to be here with you all to discuss on uh, the infrastructure requirement from catch to destination. Uh, as you all know, we have a, uh, India has got a very vast coastline of more than 7,500 kilometers. And uh, we, as Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Bharati rightly pointed out, we have very small numbers of uh, developed landing centers. And we have a huge number of uh, beach landing centers as well. I'm just talking on the Seacord product of perspective at the moment. Now, fishing activity has been there since time immemorial. I think this is one of the oldest uh, profession. Now, with the advancement and development, we have started venturing out into the open and the deeper seas as well. And you all must be aware that uh, the life of a fisherman is never easy at all. He has to break the dangerous seas. It's unruly tides and waves, the rough seas, storms, the uh, windy weather, the rain, the hot sun, et cetera, et cetera. Now, Things can even turn worse if uh, there is an engine failure to his boat or if he gets stuck in the high seas without uh, food or water. Now, when they venture out into the sea, they really don't know what they are going to get. I mean, or uh, they, they will get anything. There is total uncertainty in their profession nowadays. So many of us, I mean, a lot of us would have experienced a ride in a I mean, uh, normal tourist boat or uh, maybe uh, in in a in a canoe or something. Now in a canoe, if, we, there, if there is a small tilt, also we tend to get panic. Now we can understand how a fisherman, I mean his life on a fishing boat out in the rough sea would be. Now what I'm trying to say is, see now whatever the hard earned cash that they bring in, our main thing should be it ha definitely has to get the fair and the best value for their hard work what they have uh, brought in. So for that. The biggest thing is, see, you now we need very good landing centers and we need modern fish landing centers. Now, we need, I um, mean, uh, we need proper handling facilities. Now, there are a lot of areas where, I mean, there's a lot of lagunas are there. I won't I mean, go into detail in, uh, on those. So, we need good quality portable water. So, that is required for the fishermen for, to carry in their boats as well. So, for them to wash the fish or whatever that is caught. So you should be also remember that this is again all going for human consumption. So, and now uh, we have something uh, also, we have this uh, raw uh, eating the sashimi grid product also. For that, you have to understand one thing, there should not be even the slightest, the slightest amount of contamination, well, it is eaten as a raw. So for that, the quality requirements are so high. So now, I mean, even uh, see other products like when it, when it is cooked, you kill the, kill the bacteria a lot of. But when it is for raw eating, the uh, hygiene requirements or the quality of the product has to be extremely high. And we really need to take very good um, in, uh, precautions to handle that fish. You know, for them. So uh, at the harbor, uh, the, the fish static center, as Dr. Balaji also mentioned, that there should definitely should be good um, swim rooms for storage and uh, for handling especially. That is a key area. Now, you should understand one thing. Now, to, I mean, uh, the, See, once a uh, fish is contaminated or once deterioration start, uh, starts, there is no way we can get it back to the original thing. Only we can arrest uh, the further growth of all these things. So why, what the, the, so the key thing should be, we should avoid it before it occurs. So on an exporter's point of view, 
we definitely do not want even a single container or load of, of our fish getting rejected and coming back to us. So that is something which we cannot afford, especially in these times when the freight rates are so high, we cannot afford to get back a container. So that is one thing which we are all facing right now. So we are extremely cautious, but see, and I can tell you at the factories, we have a state of the art factories right now. They are all very, all very well advanced, very well developed. But unfortunate side is, you know, at the handling or uh, the time when it is caught. So that is where our major concern is. So bacteria is something which we cannot see, we do not know. So here is an area where which we really, really need, need to uh, really look into. And uh, uh, so the next point would be to, uh, then we need good access section, good roads, I mean, to the fish landing centers or let it be to the farms. Or, uh, I mean, uh, that definitely has to be there. Those infrastructure also has to be developed. I, don't, I mean, I think uh, now, uh, Government of India has already sanctioned uh, for the first uh, four fishing harbors to, uh, to international standards as well. So that is being worked out. And Dr. Balaji has already visited the harbor and he has also promised the work to be started as soon as possible. So once that has started, I think this definitely is going to be a facelift for the entire seafood industry. And uh, um, the other issues are there, okay, definitely we would need support for uh, developing uh, cold rooms, even uh, chill room units and all those things. And I mean, all these things definitely will add value to the cash that has been slaughtered. So, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't want to take much time, but uh, I think uh, let me wind up with this and on a very short note. And I think, uh, in, uh, I mean, in the event of the discussion, I think I can throw in more points also and wait for others also to respond. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Thank you, Mr. Ninan. Uh, very rightfully said, there are many areas of intervention. You also mentioned, you know, at the point of catching modernization, probably of the boats and infrastructure on the boat itself, you know, so that by the time the boat comes back, the fish is still uh, in, a, in a good condition. So we'll come back to you uh, to get more clarity. I would now like to uh, go to uh, Mr. Arjun Gadre. Uh, he's uh, again a lot of experience. He is the managing director of uh, Gadre Marine Exports. And uh, he is a BE in mechanical engineering uh, and an MBA. So, and he, his brand, he has, you know, created many products, uh, brands for the international markets, Meena, Gadre, Tara. I mean, uh, Dr. Balaji also mentioned about branding. So, I think Gadre Marine is doing a lot. And they also own brands like uh, Premium Seafood, Just Cook, Cut and Clean. So, a lot of good work. He's also an uh, elected member of Empada. So with that, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Gadre, you know, what from a export perspective or from a more organized uh, fishing, you know, if we have to develop infrastructure, what would be uh, areas that you would look at? What do you? So uh, you're muted if you can unmute. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, including me in this panel. Uh, I I would first, uh, uh, I mean, there is going to be obviously some amount of reputation uh, with my previous colleagues uh, from the panel, but uh, in the, uh, in, in the, uh, for the clarity of the subject, I would like to uh, go back uh, through the whole process again. Uh, you know, the value of fish, like many other uh, natural products, uh, is is for the, the highest value is sought for the fresh big fish that is available as a, as a table fish. And, and uh, you know, when, when you, uh, the value of the fish is highest when it is just caught by the fisherman. And by every passing hour, we are consistently deteriorating the uh, quality and Unfortunately, something needs to be done uh, in, 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 in the whole process in order to arrest this deterioration going further. I, there are internationally also, as well as similarly, it will, you will see in, in domestic market, there are four major pillars on which value of fish is determined. One is the size. Second is the freshness. Third is the sustainability now which is very very important and fourth is traceability these are the four main pillars on which uh, acceptance or rejection uh, of good quality and high value uh, is considered uh, globally 
I think if you look at, like uh, Mr. Nainan said, if you look at sashimi grade as the gold standard for quality of fish, I think the most important aspect is the size and the age of the fish. Uh, the age, uh, mainly because of the texture, uh, the size and texture go hand in hand. The bigger the fish, the larger, uh, the better the value. Similarly, in terms of freshness, uh, it is very important uh, to, uh, to have the fish delivered either to the processing plant or to somebody's home as fresh as possible. When I say fresh, I am very mindful of the fact that I am not saying fresh as opposed to frozen. Frozen fish is also fresh. Frozen, the opposite of frozen is, is, is chilled. Opposite of fresh is stale. So frozen and fresh are not opposites to each other. So I think let that be very clearly understood by the uh, people who are listening. Uh, in order to achieve the freshness, uh, I think there are two aspects. One is to really promote in a, in a, in a big way onboard freezing uh, on our vessels. And when we say onboard freezing, see the current vessel sizes in India, in each net haul, they catch no more than 100 uh, kilos, between 80 to 100 kilos. And so there are only certain species which have the uh, value, high value for, uh, you know, onboard freezing like squids, cuttlefish or some kind of snappers. So you really need to create a freezing infrastructure of no more than 20 to 30 kilos at a time. And I, I think a lot of people, when they look at onboard freezing, start imagining about freezing factories and cold storages and things like that. I think, I think, uh, I mean, with, with intervention from Cochin Shipyard, we need to really kind of, you know, look at alternative technologies like maybe cryogenic freezing where you have liquid nitrogen on board and use a small blast for, uh, freezer to freeze smaller quantities and save them, bring them home. That is one aspect. The other aspect is also from a government's point of view, Carrier boats need to be encouraged. Uh, see, currently what happens is the fishing trips of uh, boats are about 20 to 25 days. So you can imagine the fish caught in the first two or three days is already 20 days old by the time it's landed on the harbor. Now, if there are carrier boats which can aggregate uh, the fish from various vessels, obviously there are challenges of transferring fish at high seas and larger problems of, you know, uh, trust of the fishermen thinking whether or not you know they are their quantity and quality and price is going to be fairly given to them when they are not there in front of you know to uh, to kind of see how it is sold so these are some of the things that need to be uh, uh, addressed <clears throat> in terms of sustainability certification i think uh, by and large across the world this has become a very very uh, important qualifying criteria whether or not some of the larger known supermarkets will even accept your product or not. Uh, this, is, this is only going to become more and more difficult. And India, as we stand, we really do not have any uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel as far as uh, certification of the major commercial species are. You know, one or two species uh, of clams and other things which are very, very small and significant, uh, commercially insignificant have been certified. But looking at the larger commercial fisheries, I think there is a long, long way to go. And similarly, traceability, I think IUU as a legislation has been adopted by Europe and most of the other developed countries are going to go in similar lines. And traceability is going to become an extremely important, uh, I don't want to say a, a, a trade barrier, but a, 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 but a barrier if we are not going to establish traceability from the catching vessel uh, to, uh, to the, the export container. These are these are the four major things that we really need to address. And I have had this discussion with Dr. Balaji before, but I want to again reiterate, I think all these major aspects of uh, post-harvest landing can really be addressed if there is some way of legislating uh, that all fishing harbors should have a uh, auction process through which uh, the uh, fish landed can be sold. I think auctioning in India, especially in the southern states of Kerala and Tamil Nadu uh, in Kanyakumari district uh, is not a new concept. All the uh, fishing activity there happens only through auction. Most of the other coastal states need to adapt the same thing. I think Diga is another place where auctioning is very, very active, but all other places we don't have active. And just to list down the uh, 
the 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 importance and the uh, uh, and the benefits that auctions can bring you know first of all it can implement all the fishing bans and fishing legislation by controlling uh, allowing or disallowing what fish can be landed and sold mesh size regulation can be implemented based on what is the size of fish brought to the auction size and species control uh, can happen going forward diesel subsidies can be linked to fish landed by individual boats rather than giving a blanket uh, 3000 liters a month kind of a situation traceability can be uh, you know completely established because individual boats will be uh, tagged lots will be tagged and therefore can be sent uh, to individual factories accurate valuation of fish can be sought we will know exactly at what price what fish has been sold on a daily basis i think because it will, if 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 we go forward towards an electronic auction uh, a lot of various companies can directly participate in that auction and once you create more demand you will directly translate into better prices for the fishermen by taking away all the middlemen uh, from the process so the fishermen will definitely benefit heavily if it is all done through auction always there is going to be induced transparency in transactions more importantly involvement of banking institution which is completely non existent today in the fishing sector when like dr balaji also said you know getting loans for building uh, boats or getting you know working capital right now the banks don't have any visibility of the earnings of the boats but if you establish an auction process everything will become transparent banks will able to see what is the amount of money which is transacted and therefore they will also be able to participate auctioning house will become an important you know first step towards collecting accurate data in order to achieve sustainability certification i think a lot of uh, uh, i mean we have done preliminary studies for uh, uh, msc certification other things i think one of the biggest lacuna that we have in terms of uh, uh, you know government intervention in this whole thing is lack of accurate data and i think data collection a whole lot of uh, infrastructure and money and energy of fisheries department is spent on collecting data and if you ask anybody in the trade today nobody believes that data unfortunately so but if you get uh, you know everything to be controlled by auctions even that will happen accurate data will be sought and juvenile fishing control will come under heavy heavy control i think that is a menace in the indian fishing industry which we really need to seriously look at and for the future of our industry we need to control juvenile fishing getting ensuring all product coming through a auction system will you will be able to establish control and will be able to implement this in a better way uh, my my request to the central government is that in union territories where you have direct control over the fishing harbors maybe those would be a good case to start with rather than trying to convince state governments to uh you know change their uh, tune uh i i would also like to add another thing in terms of so the central government initiative since they have all the funding if possible they could build uh, federal government could build their own fishing harbors which would be directly in any case fishing activity beyond 12 nautical miles most of the mechanical uh, mechanized trawlers are uh, you know will come under central government's permission so if there are independent fishing harbors today what happens is boats from gujarat will come up to goa catch their fish and go back to gujarat and land you are wasting time wasting diesel ruining the uh, freshness of the thing if there was uh, two or three fishing harbors where any boat from our country can come and land rather than having a home port legislation that would really allow for a lot of time and energy saving therefore cost and improved uh, freshness uh this will also obviously lead to uh, uh fuel uh, and better costs thirdly I, and 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 the last part i want to say is that uh, i i fully agree being in the business that there is a resistance to buying frozen uh, seafood today in india although uh, frozen seafood is looked at uh, as if it is not the best quality i think there has to be a a marketing campaign by the trade associations as well as by the central government or the ministry of fisheries because whatever we said and done hinterland you cannot reach without 
taking perishability out from seafood and as long as you are keeping it only fresh there is a enzymatic process that you cannot arrest and you will always have a limited shelf life of no more than 2 to 3 days uh, if you want let's say develop madhya pradesh as a market for uh, uh, sea caught seafood there is no way for you to do it without having it frozen and therefore the image of frozen seafood needs to be improved and that would automatically allow a lot more consumption to happen it is it is a mindset it is a mindset because you know even even in coastal areas uh, people go early in the morning buy fish from the uh, uh, fish markets and go and put it in their deep freezer and eat it at night so when they put it in the deep freezer they are ruining the fish by slow freezing if a, if there is a quick frozen seafood which after defrosting also gives as good a quality if not as much as this uh, as as fresh on that day uh, but it definitely has a much better experience than putting it in the freezer yourself and that is why people have gotten a bad image of frozen food because they freeze it badly uh, a good quality frozen food even most of the sushi and sashimi is also frozen at minus 60 degrees celsius when on refrost i mean defrosting you still have as good a quality so it is a is a image problem and that image can be only changed through better marketing so i will stop now and uh, maybe thank we can you thank you mr gadre i'm i'm sure with your immense experience we could continue listening to you uh, but we would certainly you know want you to continue to give us uh, you know more that can be done both on the short term and on the long term with that i would like to pivot a little now we've heard two uh, you know speakers uh, domestic uh, you know production areas we would like to now pivot to uh, mr carter uh, and get a little bit of a global perspective so mr carter uh, christian uh, carter is a commercial counselor uh, royal norwegian embassy in delhi is the director of innovation norway in india and before that uh, he was also CEO of CCB Subsea. He's held uh, various leadership roles and board positions, and he brings an immense experience. He's a master's degree in law from University of Virgin and an executive program in innovation. So we would really like to hear from Mr. Carter what he sees. Uh, he's, he's also very knowledgeable about uh, India and, you know, what are the programs, uh, uh, you know, Norway and India have been doing together. Over to you, Mr. Carter. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Meta, for the very kind introduction, uh, I must say, uh, and a very good afternoon to, to you all. Uh, respected Joint Secretary, Dr. Balaji, Mr. Meta, uh, Mr. Sundara, Mr. Alex Ninan, uh, Mr. Arjun Gadre, Mr. Matthew Joseph, and not least Dr. Shain Kumar, uh, that I look forward to to discuss with later today. So, and thank you, CII, for the for the invitation. It is indeed a a pleasure and uh, uh, and an honor actually to to be part of a panel so esteemed and to be given the opportunity to to address this event. Um, I have uh, prepared just a few slides uh, and uh, would like to uh, you know set a context by by giving you some background and a snapshot uh, of the situation in in Norway. Um, and and our our ocean industries and and how and in particular of course the fisheries and, and aquaculture sector so if you can go on to the next slide um am i the one that uh, okay yes thank you very much so um although we we are a very small country uh with a population of just uh, around 5.4 uh, million inhabitants. And Norway has uh, one of the longest uh, coastlines in the world, if we include the islands and the fjords. And our national sea territory is is about five times larger than our land territory. And and consequently, our ocean industries uh, are essential components of the Norwegian economy, uh, right? So accounting for uh, forty percent of of all the value add and and seventy percent of our exports. Um, and as well as uh, being uh, one of the world's uh, largest and, and, and actually most advanced maritime nation, we are a huge export of, of seafood. And I'll get back to that. Uh, we've also created this uh, financial center for, for the global ocean economy and the Oslo Sco uh, Stock Exchange. 
is the second largest shipping exchange in the world and the world's largest for seafood. Uh, I will also uh, talk a little bit about uh, the clusters. We have developed uh, around 20 regional industry and ocean-based clusters uh, that are based along the Norwegian coast. Uh, and this has very much contributed to, to innovation and has uh, in many ways presented a, represented a platform for collaboration between government, uh, industry, and, and research institutions. Um, would also like to emphasize that uh, from the government side, there is of course a very strong focus on sustainability, but we very much now see that this is becoming more industry driven. So the industry uh, already for many years have been implementing uh, sustainability goals and have managed to, to implement them in, in their operations. And that is something that uh, further, you know, um, uh, enables, I would say, uh, innovation and, and also economically sustainable business models. So if you can go to the next slide, um, a snapshot of, of, uh, of the situation when it comes to, to exports. Uh, we are the, the, the second largest uh, seafood export in the world after China and uh, the world's largest uh, producer and exporter of salmon. So 95% of the salmon that we produce is actually exported. And, um, and seafood is, is uh, one of Norway's largest export sectors after oil and gas and, and metals. Uh, and and this, one of the sectors that, that has seen the strongest growth. So, so in 10 years, uh, we have uh, more than doubled our um, our ex export value and also the, the amount of fish that we export. And 2021 was the best year ever for Norwegian seafood exports despite COVID. And we exported uh, more than 3 million tons of, of fish uh, from the aquaculture sector and the fishery sector. And uh, we exported uh, seafood worth uh, almost 14 billion US dollars. And that uh, sets a record both in volume and, uh, and in value. And it represents the equivalent of, of 42 million seafood meals uh, every day uh, of the year. And as we say in Norway, um, actually nobody is in a bigger hurry than a dead salmon. That is, uh, you know, it's something that uh, is, is actually quite true. And uh, this brings me to, you know, the supply chains and the importance of, of efficiency, but, but also, let's say, a sustainable efficiency. And um, if you can go to the next slide, because I won't spend too much time on, you know, going in, in depth in solutions and so on, just to give you a snapshot of, of what we fo are focusing on in Norway. So we have a very, a very holistic approach to the development of our ocean industries and in particular the aquaculture and fishery sector. So policies is very important. Uh, of course, uh, we have a strong innovation coming from not only within the aquaculture and fishery sectors, but with addition, uh, additions from other ocean industries. Uh, technology development infrastructure is of course key. And the, uh, let's say the way that we exploit the infrastructure that we already have, uh, sustainability and business models are, are the key words. So if we can go to the next slide. Uh, yes, so, uh, I think that uh, I think that Dr. Balaji made a very strong point um, when he said that uh, that COVID is uh, I don't know if you said it was a blessing, but at least I, I think that um, that COVID has created a disruption that should create new opportunities, and it has certainly done that in in Norway, uh, and we have seen that innovation has increased substantially. The last couple of years, and we have also seen a lot of risk capital coming into the into the aquaculture sector uh, in particular. Um, so, um, so due to the importance of of the fisheries and aquaculture sector in Norway, uh, our, our government has always been very hands on uh, and worked in close contact with the industries as well as the research communities. And like I said, the the so called cluster, these physical clusters of companies. And, and also um, uh, the more, let's say, formal setups of the clusters, they have really contributed to create this so-called triple helix model 
uh, with all the stakeholders uh, are very much in frequently, frequently in contact. And I think that that uh, brings the best solutions, the, the adequate solutions, but, but also the, the sustainable solutions because they are very much anchored across all the, all the stakeholders. Um, so, so we have, uh, uh, you know, constantly are developing policies and, uh, and um, you know, regardless of, of what kind of government that we have, there's always strong emphasis in, in staying up to speed uh, with with the developments within the industry. Um, so right now we are working on a, a more simplified uh, lighting system. Uh, this is very much due to the, uh, you know, to the to the uh, technology developments and the emergence of of new players. And um, so this is something that uh, is is ongoing. So uh, we we look forward to you know do this in a in a proper manner. Because we we are now seeing very strong uh, developments within new areas related to mariculture and land-based aquaculture, and um, through the years we have uh, created many incentives to develop new technologies and business models. And this pretty much started with the oil crisis in 2014, uh, where we took a, 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 a you know a huge hit. I was in the oil and gas industry at the time. And what we saw was that uh, a lot of the, the you know, the, the suppliers that have been supplied the oil and gas industry uh, started to, to, to use their skills and technologies and their infrastructure to facilitate the growth in other ocean industries. So I think that uh, offshore aquaculture is very much a result of collaboration between the, the offshore supply industry and, uh, and the aquaculture sector. So. Um, and in addition to that, I, I would also like to emphasize that uh, we have also been very focused, focusing very much on startups uh, through incubators um, that focuses on the whole value chain. And, and we do have very good examples actually of, of uh, startups that have uh, been uh, hosted in Norway and that have uh, succeeded in India actually. There is a company called AquaConnect that was hosted in, in my hometown, actually, Bergen, and that now uh, recently received a, a very strong uh, uh, acknowledgement of, of their developments here in India. So, so that is uh, also something I would like to, to emphasize. Um, so um, offshore aquaculture or, or mariculture, I think it's, it's called here in, in India, is something that I think will represent uh, a very relevant uh, concept uh, to India and, and something that I think for Norway actually will represent a, a very strong, let's say, export concept and, and product. Um, so uh, when it comes to, uh, to land-based aquaculture, uh, we currently have around 70 different uh, companies working with 80 different projects along the Norwegian coast. coast. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, uh, technology and business development uh, in, in the land-based segment. We have, of course, the RAS technology, uh, but several projects will also uh, use abundant seawater and convert it uh, through an osmosis process to get the fresh water. And uh, with focusing on, on more on circular economy, uh, many of the projects will also look into how they can recover and use the sludge and use it uh, for fertilizers and also uh, in, in actually in biogas production. So that brings me over to um, the circular economy, which is a very strong focus in, in Norway. Uh, and if you see the picture on, on the right, this is a, a satellite photo of a, of a very established industrial area. In, in Norway, in, on the west coast, that has been based on oil and gas related activities for more than 40 years, and uh, with, with the largest refinery in, in Norway, as well as the largest supply base for the offshore installations in the North Sea, and taking advantage of the existing uh, infrastructure capacity and all the resources that are available, they are now facilitating for new industries like like CCS, renewable energy, and aquaculture. Um, and in this particular case, the, the plan is to uh, to share uh, both the infrastructure and the surplus waste 
uh, like heat and oxygen uh, from industrial processes to bring down the cost and to facilitate the establishment of land-based aquaculture. So this is a, a very exciting product. And I think that it, it's a very good example of, of how we can establish infrastructure for the aquaculture sector through existing infrastructure. It's very much, you know, the kind of a, a circular economy approach that that brings a lot of efficiency. Um, and uh, that also uh, makes it in a way, I would say more sustainable as it doesn't expand the physical impact or industrial footprint uh, and negative environmental impact through, through the use of, of new land. So it also uh, in a way uh, eliminates some risk, right? Because at least in Norway, which is a small country, even though we have a long coast, uh, uh, we're very much, you know, concerned about the environment and, and to keep, uh, you know, uh, nature as it always has, has been. So it's very much to, to maximize the use of existing resources. And I think that, you know, without going too much into, into depth, I would really like to just emphasize that, that, that there is already a lot of infrastructure in, in India along the coast. So, so if we are able to, you know, maybe create a platform where we can merge some of these different industries uh, and uh, you know increase efficiency and create strong hubs uh, i think that uh, that at least could could be something to 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 explore uh, further um, lastly would like to again emphasize the you know the the, the business uh, cluster model that that we have established in norway and this very much contributes to the technology transfer and learning across businesses and industries um, and also facilitate more flexible uh, labor distribution. Um, and in many ways, uh, since since now companies, uh, you know, work across sectors, they involve themselves, uh, uh, you know, within different sectors, and that makes it also more resilient, actually, and, and less vulnerable to to market fluctuations. Um, so. Um, the emerging industries that we see now, like mariculture and land-based aquaculture, they're very much building on the technology and the solutions uh, and, and infrastructure that has been developed by the existing industries and, and very much uh, the industries that, that host these, these strong uh, uh, ocean clusters. We'd also like to add that uh, uh, we are a very open economy, so, so, so we also uh, are very conscious on on the fact that there is a lot of knowledge uh, out there in, in, in other markets. So we also uh, are very open to, to import solutions from, from abroad. And I'm, and I'm quite sure that that has also added more traction to the, to the uh, innovation and technology development that we have seen uh, the last couple of years. Yes, okay, so I think uh, if, I, if I just, uh, conclude with just showing you one slide. This is uh, maybe a bit out of the box, but if you can go to the next slide, there, there, there are also some very interesting, uh, let's say, uh, there's a lot of interesting innovation within within business models. And um, I actually just thought about this, uh, this company, you know, when I when I talked to Arjun the other day, when we had this pre call about, you know, value add, how can we add value to to the product? And this is a picture that I took myself a couple of years ago in the city of, of Kirkenes in the north of, of Norway. And this is king crab. And uh, as you can see, this, um, this king crab, it, it has a tag. And it's not the price, but it's actually a QR code where you can actually, and you can do it right now, actually, if you want, uh, take a picture of the QR code. Then this is an example of a king crab, and you get the whole story of the king crab. Uh, where it was born, where it probably was was born, and uh, uh, who the, you know the fisherman's name, and this is a product that uh, is a uh, let's say the only product of of the company is is live king crab, and uh, what they do is that uh, they uh, they they fish the king crab and they uh, transport it alive and they sell it alive to the international markets. And that comes actually with a uh, actually quite a substantial cost 
uh, but through, you know, uh, of course, effective supply chains that they have established, uh, they they are have a quite a reasonable cost anyway. But the point is that people are actually willing to pay for for live king crab, and when they sell it alive, they also maximize the price, right? Because it's the weight is is higher. So uh, it's just to give you a very uh, simple snapshot of of how you know uh, some companies actually are able to create value just by adding you know a feature like this 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 QR code and also selling this this crab alive and it comes fresh to restaurants from Norway to restaurants in Toronto and in in Shanghai and in other uh, you know big cities where we have a very strong middle class so just to give you a a, a very you know interesting example of of uh, how uh, yeah you know entrepreneurs can can you know step into a a, a new market and uh, and create value through experiences that they have from other sectors. So these are not fishermen. They have agreements with the fishermen and they have a very risk based uh, and uh, you know a, some a risk sharing approach together with the fishermen that that also makes this sustainable uh, both for the fishermen and for the for the company. So uh, I think I'll just end there, Mr. Meta. Thank you very much for the time, and uh, it was uh, yeah, it was a real pleasure to to speak and look forward to the panel. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Carter. Really insightful, uh, you know, images and a presentation. Uh, obviously, many areas where India and Norway can collaborate and work together. You know, we can. And uh, again, when we talk sustainability, we think of technology, but a very good example of circular economy making things more sustainable. Uh, I think, uh, again, many, many uh, good points made by you. Uh, Aqua Connect, you mentioned as a startup, uh, you know, doing a lot of uh, uh, good work in India. I would like to now move to another startup, uh, 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 Mr. Matthew, who's with us today. So he uh, has over 20 years, you know, uh, started what we started as sea to home now becomes fresh to home. And again, changing the concept of fresh fish, uh, uh, connecting, I think, to over 2 million, uh, you know, customers in India and uh, overseas. So without uh, wasting much time, I know we are already, you know, behind schedule, but would want this to continue and hear from uh, Mr. Matthew. And, uh, you know, uh, we have one more speaker at the end, uh, uh, Mr. Sh uh, Dr. Shain Kumar. So over to you, Mr. Matthew. So thank you, Mehta. And all uh, respected dais, especially the Balaji sir. So first of all, I would like to a big salute to Balaji because, sir, uh, as per your vision and dreams, so we are very proud this type of man in the top level in fish industries in India. Uh, but sir, you want to more hard work to realize your dreams in the Indian fisheries because you are driving the government sector mechanism. So that is the difference between the government and the private. So me or any other co-founders of Fresh to Home want to do a things to practically in the top bottom level of my company, it will happen within one day. That is the difference between the private sector and the government sector. So you already mentioned. So you please depend more private sector in infrastructure facilities and the business especially in Indian fish industries, but it is very tough. Anyway, sir, when I started in 2012, c2home.com, that was India's first online fish market. In that time, our Indian seafood local fish industry was around 42 billion US dollar. Now, this 2022, this is around after 10 years, this around 74.1 billion US dollar, that's a huge markets in Indian local fish markets. But you know, from this 74.1 billion, only 3% is doing the organized players. That means the balance 97% still now in our unorganized supplier, especially the wet markets. So we have a, even in, in fresh to home, for fresh to home, or leases or that type of uh, organized players have a big, huge market in our front. We are only in the 3%. In that 3%, we 
the online players doing only the 6% of the 3%. So a big huge market in our friends. That is a big huge challenge and a huge uh, uh, chances to our farmers and our fishermen. So I am coming to my point. So the, as a startup, the main thing is uh, we have no infrastructure facilities in government level. That all all speakers is already mentioned that. So sir, if we want to start a startup in India, it's a very big challenge because we want to invest. The startup company want to invest more amount for built a, this type of infrastructure because as a startup, as a online company we can give the assurance to our customers you will get the fisheries fish without any chemicals or any preservatives that means we want to keep our cold chain from the point of the catching point to the up to the end customer we want to keep our cold chain without any break so if i want to keep that uh, cha chain we want to invest more money to the um, uh, company Otherwise, now fresh to home is already we have our infrastructure, no doubts. But when I started the city home, that time I am facing the big challenge of that. Any newcomers is coming in this field in startup, it, this was a very big challenge because that much of amount we want to invest. That is the one challenge of a startup company if you want to start in a uh, fisheries industry. That's why our 99% startup is engaged in IT field. That is one of the main challenges. The IT field, they can operate or start a startup in a single room from a laptop. He can operate, start a startup company from a laptop or in our mobile. But uh, not like that, we can start a fish industry. So that is a, one of the big challenges. Why the other people is not, uh, so many people is not started a startup in fisheries industries in India. So that is only the help, government can help the all that type of people, give the full, encourage the people to start the fish industries as a startup. And uh, sir, this one is, uh, the second uh, one is the, 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 I think the compare with other countries, the lack of technological advancements used in fish fisheries industries now, in India especially. That's a very hard to convince the local ground level fishermen and farmers. That was a big challenge. You see, sir, we are using our own a app for procurement. In the fresh to home consumers, uh, customers seeing the app, that is a app you can order the things. But we have an, another app that using around 1,500 of fishermen in India, around 150. Uh, sea harbors in India. They are using that electronic cap and they are, oh, uh, they, we are procurement our seafood through that app. But it was a very big challenge to convince these things to the fishermen. But that is I am, uh, first I am pointing about because we are the private sector. That's why we can do this, did this. Otherwise in a government level, it's a very tough. Because the government need uh, go, uh, the state government support and the state government employee support and the central government support. So many hurdles is there. So that app, the world first uh, organized app, electronic app in for this unorganized fish uh, auction that we got the patent from the US government. And, and sir, that type of one, another uh, technology we are up, uh, adopt in our farming also. In Kerala, yeah, as per a, go, a Andhra or Orissa farmer, farming is looking, we are doing only 40 acre farming in Kerala. It's a very small, but in, like in Kerala, it's a 40 acre is a very big one. So we are farming only the basa. So we not, we are doing directly. We are giving the old technologies for 10 farmers. There are so many years experience with the farming. But in Kerala, that farmers get the basa two kilo up size. They will get the before that within 10 months. 
but we are adopting some technologies not a big one one or two technologies is every day is going to the farming and they are testing the water and salinity and ammonia level and both that type of small technology we are giving them and we are giving the what type of food what type of feed that type of so many things we are giving the other base advantage to them now the our farming our the basa is coming 2 kg up within 8 months that means around 7.5 rupees less than the production cost of farmers from the last farming so that's a huge difference that type of technology we want to implement in our fishermen and the farming areas but it is a very big challenge i know because this type of uh, local uh, ground level fishermen farmers is depending this technology and we want to convince them that's a very big challenge but without this this type of technologies advancement we cannot grow sir if we want to grow and want to get more advantage for our fishermen or farmers we want to do the technology in the farming and the fishermen and the catching so one of our uh, the before when i think arjun is already informed uh, and this nainan also is caught the, see the our uh, yellowfin tuna or bluefin tuna so we are getting and selling in india around 150 rupees or 200 rupees but when the catching time of the tuna if the fisherman is keeping just like international standard we can sell that same tuna for 2000 rupees so that type of knowledge we want to convince to the local people otherwise we cannot survive and the, the same thing the technology the our infrastructure facilities negative point is every year sir we are losing around 25 percent of our product as a wastage from our the production from the farming or from the seashore mainly the seashore catching nearly 25 percent of our products as a spoilage because without of our infrastructure facilities in our in fish industries so this type of challenges we are facing in this indian industry and indian startup just like a fish industries mr matthew if i can just prompt you you know we are running a little late can yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Just, just, just one point, sir. We have a huge uh, a, a market in front of our because the world consumption of fish around 20.8 kilo per person. But in India, the old studies, different studies is telling only 4 to 7 kilo per person. That means that's a huge difference is there for the consumption of fish per person in India. So that have a big market in our front. So we want to uh, give some knowledge or some marketing, a massive awareness program to the Indian industry or Indian local people. Why you are using for fish? I think three or four years back, the Indian egg industries, egg producers something, they were giving a, a massive advertisements. You want to eat minimum one egg in a day. It was a very big impact is there. So that type of one, uh, a massive awareness program we want to give the indian people to eat fish because especially for the health wise the old cardiologist telling you don't eat red meat you eat fish so that type of science also behind with us so why we are not using that right so if we are going like that this our indian fish industry is going within three four years within 100 billion dollar big market so yeah. thank you, thank you very much. Time is thank you. Know. Thank you, uh, Mr. Matthew. I'm, I'm sure you know we could have uh, discussed more. Uh, unfortunately, we are already over time. I have uh, one very important last speaker that I want to go to, Dr. Shain Kumar, who is uh, recently wow. in December taken over as uh, Director, National Institute of Fisheries, uh, Post Harvest Technology and Training, NIFAD. So, uh, Dr. Shain Kumar, again, a uh, very illustrious uh, career, more than 15 years. Uh, he's had uh, many uh, positions in uh, MPEDA also. So, uh, without, uh, you know, waiting, let's uh, hear what uh, Dr. Shain Kumar has to say from an academic perspective. 
Sir, if you can unmute, please. Uh, thank you, CIA, for inviting this uh, in this discussion. And uh, respected uh, Secretary Balaji, sir, and Sagar Mehra, sir, and my dear colleagues. Uh, so I think almost all the panelists uh, discussed about the uh, post harvest issues and all these things. I just want to throw some main uh, areas which we are having the post harvest issues. Almost 25% of post harvest loss is already happening in the sector right now. So main areas of phosphorus losses is happening in uh, fishing vessel and uh, fishing harbors. So these are the two areas and other time is called call chain transportation and uh, okay, we, you can say the next stage is crossing plan and uh, ultimately it is going to airports or seaports. So this is a channel which we are going right now. Crossing plan is okay. We are having enough uh, 600 crossing plants in the country and it is doing in a very well in a good manner but in the fishing vessel and uh, uh, actually in harbors infrastructure is i think we need a lot of improvement in these areas obviously because of the post losses is mainly in marine sector is due to this only and uh, uh, there is uh, when i am saying when we are looking into the what what are the post harvest uh, infrastructure like lacunas in the sector is actually uh, we can call it as wife w i f e because that is a common, uh, we can easily remember wife means uh, water, ice, fuel, energy. So this is very important thing, which uh, we can as a policy makers and everything, we have to think in the level, in the, the basic infrastructure uh, in the country uh, when we are planning and all these things, water, ice, fuel, uh, and energy or electricity, whatever it may be. So wife is very important in planning all these activities. So there is, uh, right now, our fisherman is bringing everything in his own way to fishing vessels, to in the harbor. So, but because water, ice, fuel, and electricity is also not available in most of the cases. But because of he's bringing everything into the harbor, the harbor is crowded and congested, and the handling is, very poor handling is ha happening at the, uh, harbors and which is leading to the possible losses. This is a real fact. I already our joint secretary explained very in a detailed way. And these are the challenges we are currently uh, facing in the sector. And uh, so the way forward is to address this basic uh, infrastructure facility, creation of basic infrastructure facilities in the harbor and the fishing vessel also, because fishing vessel also same thing is required. Almost everything is required in this aspect. And the next one I want to say, the processing sector is, uh, we are like our colleague from Norway, number two in the world rank export. We are the, Norway is the two second position. We are the fourth largest exporter, but with our ample opportunities for India also to come become the uh, number one or number at least number two exporter in the, in the very soon. So in that aspect, I want to point out the processing sector also can improve our uh, technologies and uh, export in especially in chapter 16 because prepared and preserved food that area we are not uh, uh, capitalizing much in the world scenario so our chapter 3 products we are very good we are almost exporting 7 billion us dollar and but we are having a good opportunities in chapter 16 that is prepared and preserved and ready to eat products so there is a challenges are in, a lot of challenges are involved in value addition and it's a risk based business so these challenges we have to take in a positive way and to come up in uh, uh, with the strategies. And I think recently the Government of India scheme on uh, uh, product linked incentive scheme, that PLI scheme is uh, to create a global champion in the sector is also a promising one to uh, uh, to promote validation in the sector. And obviously PM of uh, Prime Minister Pradhan Mandri Mansa Sambhara Yojana is also is a very good scheme for addressing the post uh, losses in the sector. So, uh, in the, I, I am not taking much time on this. Uh, I think this uh, time is, I think, approaching one and a half, uh, more than one and a half hour is over now. I think these are the core issues, and uh, we need uh, uh, awareness programs and trainings. And uh, NIFAT is already uh, uh, doing such kind of training programs. We are happy to strengthen our tra training programs and the technological aspects in coming days. And uh, once again, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks to CII for uh, calling for this meeting. And thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor.
so uh, a lot of good ideas, good ideas many ideas, eminent many speakers a lot of experience lot of across experience the table across the table now i am hearing echo is is it coming from no, it's okay it's okay so uh, two three uh, you know main points if i can capture one is the need for dialogue a need for dialogue between government central government state government and industry very very important there are a lot of good examples that we can learn from each other infrastructure wise uh, again as somebody mentioned the golden hour you know as soon as a catch is caught on the boat it needs to get into some sort of a blast freezing cold storage maybe 20 kg maybe 30 kg so so that is important uh, after that it starts deteriorating very quickly irreversibly so we need that uh, infrastructure of you know once it hits the port reaching the market reaching you know so reefer trucks connectivity not only storage but connectivity to make it reach the markets as fast as possible maybe to the processing plant maybe to the consumption center so these are two three very clear uh, uh, areas that came across i know we've uh, overshot our time uh, but uh, it was such a lively discussion thank you everyone thank you the panelists uh, thank you dr uh, Balaji, uh, for your guidance and uh, you know for uh, staying with us. Uh, thank you. Back to you, CI. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.